Welcome everyone. Thank you for watching this webinar. I'm Chad Hamilton, Director of Practice Management for Brown & Company. Our topic today is investing in the midst of uncertainty. We're going to give you our perspective on the coronavirus and its impact on the markets. We originally did this presentation live on March 19th. We had a good group, I think over 80 people on there. But we had some audio issues, so we're re-recording it for playback in order to improve that. And also, we've had uh, a lot of updates over the last week. As all of you know, the market, the economy, this pandemic, uh, changes are happening so rapidly that we thought it would make sense to re-record it. So we're doing that on today, March 26th, to include uh, just a few new things that have developed we uh, have sent out a number of written communications that for all the clients on the call, you're going to be well aware of that. We've had at least a couple per week since the end of February when the coronavirus news first shook the markets. So many of you should be aware of some of our thinking about the current environment, but we decided that a deeper dive into this was warranted and that being able to talk through and walk through visuals would be helpful. So that's why we're doing a webinar to really uh, be able to get into this in a little more detail and hopefully educate in some more depth and in, into our thinking and and um, our insights into the current environment. We want this call to be primarily forward looking, but we're going to spend just a few minutes up front recapping what we've done over the last 12 months to give you a little context of our position. So first, Starting in early 2019, we began talking significantly about preparing for a recession, not because we had a crystal ball, but because we knew that the markets are cyclical. And after just a tremendous move on the upside in one of the longest bull markets in history, uh, about 11 years, we just know that what goes up must come down. Now, we had conversations with our clients last year about taking some chips off the table, moving a portion of stocks and shifting into bonds, and, uh, and doing a few other moves in the portfolio to de-risk it in, in some ways. The, the challenge of that strategy and the downside is that you would willingly give up some of the upside, and we, we talked through that, which happened in the latter half of 2019 and the first month and a half of this year. However, most of our clients were willing to give up some of the upside in order to reduce some downside risk. So those are some of the tactical moves we made. Our team knows from experience that most of the time, uh, the event that triggers a big downturn is completely unexpected. The coronavirus was absolutely out of left field. No one saw this coming. And once they did, the effects started to materialize immediately. And that's why we do try to be proactive in, in thinking about how we're, we're positioned. Because if we wait for the news headlines, it's typically too late. So we're going to cover three bullet points today. Uh, the first is our commentary on the economy and the coronavirus. The second is the resilience of the stock market and give you some historical perspective. And then third, what do you do now? What what proactive actions can you take? And we'll talk about the value of preparation and planning. And it's not too late to do any of those things. And so we'll leave it on some action-oriented notes on that front. Uh, this pandemic has really affected absolutely everyone in big ways. And of course, not just financially. The big indexes have gained some ground in the last week but they're still down at or near 20% from recent highs, at least as of March uh, 26th. And the COVID-19 coronavirus and the economic implications of reduced daily activity, uh, of course, are very real. And we want to provide some commentary on the economy and, and the types of things that we're looking for going forward. So what the market cares most about right now is not what the Fed is doing or even the economic reports. The most important thing is the state of the virus itself and health concerns. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen charts like this one, but it captures it really well. The whole containment strategy right now is meant to limit the spread 
so that our healthcare system is not stretched beyond capacity, right? And that's that dotted line just to, to indicate the healthcare system capacity. Unfortunately, in places like Italy and Iran and, and you know, even potentially New York City, which hits a lot closer to home, um, they've had situations like this red curve where the capacity for treating patients was just simply overloaded and there aren't enough beds, ventilators, or even doctors to treat everyone who needed it. So the experts are pretty much all saying the same thing that, you know, this can be avoided with some drastic types of measures. And, and we're seeing a lot of those things right now. And, and these are certainly hopeful signs, uh, particularly for parts of our country that are not yet um, really experiencing this, the full effects of this, which is, is most of the country at this point, shutting down basically everything, of course, schools, churches, sporting events, concerts, air travel, even restaurants, except for takeout now. Um, and while that may seem extreme, it could potentially save hundreds of thousands uh, or, or more, even in the millions of lives. So we're in a, a sharp decline of global economic activity. We believe it's basically a foregone conclusion that we're entering into a recession. The question is, how quickly the economy can bounce back. And that will depend first on the outbreak itself, how much of it is contained, and secondly, the fiscal response. To what extent is the government able to move quickly and substantively to help small business owners sustain through this? We saw a $2 trillion uh, package and legislation that the White House and the Senate agreed upon just a couple days ago. And that uh, obviously was something that the market was really wanting to see. And we saw a very positive response there because it's really all about helping small business owners and those individuals that are out of work sustain through a really difficult period, hopefully not more than a few months, but we, we really don't know the timeline yet. But that's the key is just to be able to get through this stretch of time where we're in this lockdown phase. Here's what we're looking for and anticipating. The more actual data that we get about the spread of this virus, the more certainty, and I use that in air quotes, but, but certainly at least less uncertainty that we'll have. And, and when that happens, there's less fear that rules the day. And as the data from more widespread testing comes in, the less the markets will be ruled by panic and fear of the unknown. One of the issues is the lack of testing capabilities and resources available in the U.S., which has been very disappointing. But in the last week, we're definitely seeing improvement. It, it's, it's been really significant. So one week ago, we were conducting, we in the, the U.S. as a whole, just over 10,000 tests per day. That was as of March 16th. That number has risen to more than 60,000, and even I'm seeing over 70,000 uh, per day as of yesterday um, in, in just over a week's time. So that's very encouraging, right? Because it means we're getting enough data that we can start to know what we're up against. So, like the TARP program, uh, that vote all over again. Uh, TARP was a tro troubled asset relief program back in 08 and 09. Like I said, the White House and Senate agreed upon this $2 trillion safety net plan. And um, we believe it, it is absolutely necessary. And we're relieved to learn that the two sides did figure out a way to come together and, and ultimately reach an agreement. That's basically business uh, interruption insurance, right? So if it works effectively, it'll provide money to businesses and individuals where losses have occurred due to no fault of their own. And, um, and the goal is really to bridge the gap between now and normalization. So now we want to talk a little bit about the resilience of the stock market from a historical perspective. And also, help uh, explain how the market functions in relation to the overall economy. Now, this chart 
shows 80 years of stock market history. I thought it was pretty up to date. It was as of the beginning of March, but of course, March has been a crazy month. So there is some more volatility. You would see a little bit of a sharp turn downward and then a little bit of a bounce the past few days, um, just in the past few weeks. But nonetheless, we have 80 years of history here and the uh, it's from 1940 through the beginning of 2020 this year, uh, the first two months of this year. And over that time period, the market returned 10.6% annually, but there's no, been no shortage of reasons to worry along the way. So in the 40s and 50s, we were immersed in foreign conflicts. That included World War II, the Korean War, as well as food shortages, labor strikes, in the 60s, we had a presidential assassination, the Vietnam War, and just in general, large-scale cultural upheaval. In the 70s was the energy crisis, one of the worst bear markets as well in 73, 74, followed by interest rates at all-time highs in the late 70s and very early 80s. In the, uh, in the later 80s, we had the infamous Black Monday crash on, on Wall Street, the worst day, single day in history, and then the LA riots, the Y2K scare in the 90s, and then of course September 11th attacks and scandals, corporate scandals involving Enron, WorldCom, Tyco, and many others shook investor confidence in corporate America in the early 2000s. Then we had the global financial crisis in 08 and 09. More recently, the Ebola virus uh, outbreak, the surprise presidential election results of 2016, and of course, most recently, the coronavirus, COVID-19. The point of all, all of these is that essentially none of them were predictable. Uh, you could maybe isolate one or two and say maybe some people saw it coming, but by and large, especially with these major crisis-oriented events, they just came out of left field. And, um, and with so many of them, like so many in the past, what happened, and, and we believe will happen, is the news will get worse from here. But, and this is a key point, its ability to shock us will diminish. The economic news about the U.S. economy was not getting better at the end of the financial crisis. But stocks stopped going down every time that bad news hit. It took a lot of pain to get to that point. But eventually, bad news fatigue set in. This happened with regards to potential terror threats in the wake of 2001, and it will happen now. We have to be fully prepared for grave news reports about the spread of the contagion as well as the death rate. And we believe uh, a recession is a near certainty at this point. The economic numbers comparing March relative to February will look so bad that they seem like typos. Okay. So, you know, so with all that, it might seem reasonable to say, hey, if this is going to get worse, why not just sit out, cash out, and sit on the sidelines for a while until things start to get better, until we start to have some more clarity? The, the short answer to that is that the market moves ahead of the overall economy and has priced a whole lot of bad news in already. Now, this you can't really do a presentation like this without quoting Warren Buffett at so point because he says so many things so well. So here's one that he said back in October of 2008. And those of us in, in our office here at, at Brown and Company, Justin and Mark, and I remember it quite well. Uh, he said, let me be clear on one point. I can't predict the short-term movements of the stock market. I haven't the faintest idea as to whether stocks will be higher or lower a month or a year from now. What is likely, however, is that the market will move higher, perhaps substantially so, well before either sentiment or the economy turns up. So if you wait for the robins, spring will be over. I want to show you visually a little bit of, of what Buffett was talking about. So this chart, the light blue line, is a large cap stock index, and it starts at the beginning of 2007, and, um, and you see it right here. 
and it goes through the financial crisis and the low point. Uh, sorry, let me back that up to um, March 9th, 09 is the low point here. And then we see the recovery. This goes out through 2018, so it doesn't capture the last couple years, but you get the idea. And I really want to zero in on, on this part here. Um, a few points to make. First of all, from its low point 11 years ago to through mid-March of 2020, the S&P had a return of 290%. So just think about this low point here. Take this out all the way through and add the last couple of years in. Almost a 300% total return. It equates to more than 13% per year annualized. Now, the second point is if you look at when this rebound started, what you can see on this chart is this gray shaded area, and that represents the recession that was ongoing at the time. And what you can see is with this blue line that the rebound and the recovery started well in advance of the end of the recession. So if that recession ended in June of 09, the recovery started in early March of 09. But even then, you know, we say the recession ended, the economic headlines were really pretty awful, even at this point, even when the official end of the recession happened, the economy and the headlines around the economy were bad all the way through 2009. But so what you can say is like, what would have happened had you sat out? If you said, let's just cash out, let's sit on the sidelines, let's wait for some clarity, some better news. So you wait until early 2010, a year later, that's this blue line. And what would have happened is instead of nearly 300% return in the light blue, you would have gotten about half of that, about 150% total return. So you would have missed half of the appreciation. And of course, the green line just shows if you had gone to cash at the low point and never got back in, you would have uh, missed all of that, that upside. So this quote sums it up nicely. It's some people say they want to wait for a clearer view of the future. But when the future is again clear, the present bargains will have vanished. In fact, does anyone think that today's prices will prevail once full confidence has been restored? Now, that was Dean Witter in May of 1932. It could have been said... Uh, you know, just recently, it could have been said in the financial crisis, but this is even more astounding. You know, it's it's in the midst, it's really in the dire parts of, it was all dire granted, but right in the middle of the Great Depression. And this is just a few weeks before the end of the worst bear market in history, but it certainly didn't feel like anything was getting better or even that there was any hope on the horizon at that point. So let's go back to the financial crisis and think back um, 11 years. And this gives you a reminder of the types of news and headlines we were seeing back then. Following one of the worst years for stocks in history, equities were down. So 2018, you got to remember, it's like, call, call it a 50% downturn for equities. At the beginning of 2009, the, the next year, in just a couple months, it was down another 28%. Outflows for, from funds were at this near historic highs as a reflection of investors wanting to sit on the sidelines and wait it out. And this just gives you a sense of the emotional environment at that time. So there were plenty of signals telling you to get out, but the rebound was quick. And this is indicative of market rallies following a bear market. They bounce back very swiftly and often at the time when you least expect it. So this chart shows the rebound from the low point, March 9th, 09, until the end of 2009. And what you can see here, this bar chart on the left, is that the market recovered about 68%. That was the upside from its low point. But if you missed just the five best days, you would have gotten only 32%. You would have missed more than half of the upside. And then if you missed the 10 best days out of about 300, you would have missed more than three quarters of the positive gains for that year. 
I'm sure many of you, many people have seen some version of this chart. Uh, it just shows the emotional life cycle of investing. And the point here is that the best investors like situations where panic is full blown and it's utterly certain to get worse. So what we're showing here um, is, uh, is just what that looks like, right? So the point of maximum opportunity is when things look really terrible. It's with a bear market, like we're experiencing, it's kind of like pushing a beach ball underwater. When it starts to reemerge, it doesn't just drift gradually, it pops out of the water. And, and you're seeing that with some of the, the, both the down days and the up days, where these, um, these moves are tremendous. And, and so it's more of, at the, at the bottom, it's not determined by extensive analysis. I wish it were. I wish that we could, you know, ba based on algorithms and just enough crunching of the numbers, we could figure that out. But what it is, is it's more of a feeling that sets in at the, at the low point for the market. And like we mentioned earlier, the news is still bad then when the recovery gets underway, but its ability to shock us is gone at that point. And, um, and we, you know, we actually started to see some of this play out. Like today, March 26th is when I'm recording this. We learned that 3.3 million workers filed for unemployment benefits in one week. I mean, it's sad. It's tragic news. It's, you know, our hearts go out to these people. That's so many people that, that have lost their jobs. So this is, this is really heavy stuff, all right? And it's astronomical to think that over 3 million people filed for unemployment in one week. That's nearly five times more than the previous high ever recorded for a single week. And yet, what did the market do? The same day that we got this astronomically bad unemployment news, the S&P and the Dow were both up over, five, over 6%. So again, the market moves ahead of the economy, prices a lot of the bad news in already. So even with these dire headlines, that does not uh, always correlate with the market. And sometimes like a day like today, it's, uh, it's vastly different. So now for the third and final point on our agenda, what should you do now? Most importantly, have a plan. You know, regardless of your age, having a plan in place will give you the proper framework and context for evaluating the effects of the downturn on your situation. We have tools that, uh, some proprietary tools that we, we use to really help simplify the complex. One's called the Retirement Shock Absorber we've been using for decades to help that do this. And, um, and so I'll just give you an example of, of what this looks like. So the, the blue here represents capital available. That's all the assets that you have, okay? And you know we always have to use some kind of sample numbers here. They could be, you could have 10 times or 20 times more than this or, or five or 10 times less, but the idea is the same. So your capital available is all of your assets that are available for retirement. So it wouldn't include personal residence, vacation homes, cars, anything like that. It's all of your assets uh, that, that you have to use um, to live on. And, and then your capital need is in red and that, that's a present value uh, representation in today's dollars of all of your future living expenses as well as uh, one-time financial goals or gifts or anything like that, all of the needs. So what you have in blue, what you need in red. And what we advise is at least a 20% cushion or what we call retirement shock absorber. Right here, we're showing 30%. So we like to see at a minimum 20%. And that is there for exactly times like these, right? So if you see a potential downturn in the in the realm of what we've seen where let's say your assets are down 18 percent which um you know at that at this point in a balanced portfolio it's it's not going to look quite that bad of course it's day to day um 
But nonetheless, if it, let, let's just say it's a mostly equity portfolio, someone's really aggressive, um, they, they, and they're down that much, they still have this cushion and they're still okay, right? So there's not much of a cushion left, but it's still there. And they don't have to change their plan. They don't have to go back to work. They don't have to make massive changing, changes in their lifestyle or any changes at this time. And that's why we have that, that shock absorber for exactly times like this that no one can predict. And we just need to be able to absorb those kinds of shocks to the system and have a plan that is uh, sturdy enough to withstand it. The other part, and this is um, the other tool that we've developed and have used a lot over the last year, this is called a recession prep scorecard. We would say this is the single best tool we would recommend to get started with planning. And even if you're not a client, we're happy to do this for you, just give you a second opinion. It's a one pager, and it's, it's basically a nice little synopsis of a financial plan and some stress testing of the portfolio that you're in. So you could say, well, isn't a little bit too late to prepare for a recession? And we would say, this is still very applicable. And what it is, is it give you a nice snapshot as to what levers you can pull to strengthen your plan. And so it's definitely not too late to take a look at something like this and just get a sense of where you're strong um, and, and where you could improve. So it scores this on a scale of zero to 10 and, um, and ranks in these different areas where we have, have benchmarks. So just to give you an idea, you know, we've got that shock absorber that I talked about. And then we also look at things like the withdrawal rate from your portfolio, as well as your debt structure and um, how, much, how much you owe there, how much cash or dry powder is available and any hedged investments you might have or sources of income like annuities, real estate, uh, or those, those kinds of things. The second thing that we recommend doing at this point is turning on income if possible. So one of the perennial questions is when to take social security, begin drawing social security benefits. We believe that this kind of environment argues strongly for taking benefits now if you can, or certainly sooner rather than later. And the reason for that is you wanna offset your income needs as much as possible from places outside of the portfolio. So if you're retired, you're going to live off of the portfolio or you already are, it's good to stress it as little as possible and require as little as possible be drawn down from the portfolio during times like these. And, and social security pension can be a nice offset to that, as well as annuities if you have insured products. Um, the, these can be really good because they have guaranteed withdrawal benefits oftentimes, and they'll lock in a floor. So that's, that's a way to say, hey, it may be good to turn on that income now because you're actually drawing down from, you're, you're, you're drawing income from a base of value that it could be quite a bit higher than the actual market value of those investments at this point. So those are the kinds of things to be thinking about from an income standpoint. Uh, another thing that that we want to talk about is that this is a great time to think about tax management. This is the silver lining in the midst of of what has been a pretty dreadful financial season. And our clients would have received an email from us uh, about a week, week and a half ago that was explained that they'll start seeing, if you're a client on here, you already have, I'm sure, seeing some trades come through. Those are being used to harvest losses. And so it's basically the idea is we're not going to change the character of the account, but we're going to sell one position that's at a loss right now. And we're going to buy another one that is nearly the same, but not, not exactly. And and so we're staying invested. So there's really no cha substantive change to the nature of the account or the investments. But what we're able to do is lock in these losses. And then we can buy them back in 31 days if we want, or we can just hold the new position. But what that allows us to do is carry forward that capital loss indefinitely so that you can use it to offset future capital gains. So if you're selling a business, you have some kind of liquidity event, 
down the road, those losses are really good to have, or simply just to offset gains from your investment accounts for years in the future, potentially, depending on how much you can harvest. But this is the time to do those kinds of things, and we're very active on that front right now. Roth IRA conversions are another one. So, um, you know, the idea with the with the Roth IRA is you take a traditional IRA, which those withdrawals are subject, generally speaking, to full ordinary income tax. Well, with the Roth, that's all tax free, but you the the trade off is you pay the taxes up front. So, if those values are depressed and lower right now, it's it can be a really good idea to do that now, and then have the, the future growth on that grow all tax free. So you always want to, all else being equal, pay taxes on a lower amount and then have more that's growing tax free. The last one I mentioned is gifting of assets. So we would um, highly recommend for anyone that's got uh, estate tax issues or potential tax issues, if you look at at it from a growth perspective, this can be a really good time to think about removing some of those, to gifting those assets at a lower value. So the value of the gift is lower, but then also if you expect more appreciation, which, which we would typically if prices are lower, um, to get all of that future growth out of your estate. And so those, those are some of the things that you want to be thinking about. And then lastly, we would just say, be opportunistic. Now, we know that, you know, a lot of times the cliche like this is a good time to buy. Well, um, where do you have the, the money to buy? If, if you remain, have been and remain invested in the market, you may not have that opportunity. But to the extent that you do, and the reason um, that a lot of our clients, if you're listening, and, y- you know, you'll, if you think back to some of the moves that we made, over the summer for, for many of our clients, you will have some liquidity there. And that, that was the by design to have that, what we call dry powder, so that we could be an opportunistic if the market's down in the future. And we have been making some buys over the last month um, and we continue to, to look for those opportunities. So, um, so that's one of the things you wanna think about. Another thing is, when when we look at markets like this and we all know that look what we're going through right now really does have a massive impact on almost every sector of the economy every industry every company nearly to some to some extent but remember that the struggles that we're thinking about how how long are they going to last we don't have an exact timeline for this we don't know if it's 3 months 6 months a year two years even uh even even if it's a couple years and and god forbid you know hopefully it's not that long but we have to remember that with investing we're buying companies with multiples of earnings we're we're buying you know it could be 15 or 20 years of future cash flows is essentially what you're doing when you're investing and if you think about it that way if you think about decades of future earnings then the difficulty these firms are facing currently and possibly even in the next year does not warrant them being sold off to the extent that we're seeing in our opinion. So there are some really good buying opportunities out there, but our bias is definitely to upgrade the portfolio. And what we mean by that is we favor those larger companies over smaller ones, growth companies over value, and U.S. over international. And the thought process there is we want these larger firms that can really withstand some of the downturn and and just are in a really, really strong position and are really good values right now. So that's our bias. That's where we're looking for opportunities and seeing some opportunities. And with that, uh, I am going to close it up. I'll just say that these This is where you can find some resources. We're aggregating everything at this website. We have lots of materials available as well as slides from this presentation, any number of articles and commentary as well. And lastly, you know, I'd say no one knows how long this thing will last, but we do know that this too will pass. 
it will be part of our history and contribute to our national consciousness, just like 9-11 and the Great Recession have. And, you know, ultimately, we believe that good things will come out of bad. We look forward to seeing what those are. And just want to say, stay safe, everyone. And, and thank you so much for taking time to, to listen to what we had to say.